All right, so in the first part of this video, we said that although we are in the second year of the bull market and there's over 90% probability that the market will end higher this year, the market cannot go up in a straight line. The market has been relentlessly going up almost in a straight line for the last three to four months. So there will be corrections along the way that we need to be psychologically prepared for. And when those corrections happen, no one knows exactly when it's going to happen. Like I said, we could guess that it's somewhere in mid mid-February to the end of March, going to get a correction, another one is September to October. But when these corrections come and the market begins to pull back down to their moving averages, these are the times that we can take opportunity in the market. Again, the whole point is not to be afraid of these corrections, but to embrace these corrections and take advantage of these corrections to add more and more shares to high quality businesses. So what are the stocks I'm going to focus on what are the sectors I'm going to focus on this year that I think could outperform the market? Well, the first thing to mention is that I believe that the best stocks to buy are the ones that you already own. So my priority is to always add more shares of my existing stocks in my portfolio because these are already great companies. And then after that, I would then add shares of new companies if I find new companies that are even better than the companies that I already own. Okay, so having said that, let's jump into this video where I'll talk about which sectors do I think are going to outperform the market this year and what are the most compelling stocks that I'm holding and I'm adding to. Right. Now, I originally presented these slides during my Mar Market Outlook event 2024 back on the 20th of January as well as the following week on my online Market Outlook event, which I think some of you did attend. Um, so uh, what I presented some of the stock, some of the sectors have already run up quite a bit since I presented it. And you may find, oh, it's too late right now. They've already gone up. But like I said, don't worry. Uh, it doesn't go up in a straight line. There will be corrections along the way, along this year, where I think that there'll be a chance to add shares of these companies as well. So having said that, let's jump in. So last year, 2023, the best performing sectors were technology, communication services, and consumer discretionary. And the three or the four worst performing sectors were healthcare, energy, consumer defensives, and utilities. So how about this year? What sectors would likely outperform this year? Well, I think these are the sectors that, number one, will benefit from falling interest rates. Now, so far the Fed has not yet cut rates, but they should be cutting uh, by the mid of this year. The long interest rates, the 10-year Treasury yield, has come down from 5%. Uh, but it did bounce back up a bit now to above about 4.15%. But I think the long-term uh, Treasury yield will kind of like consolidate and move lower towards the end of the year. So which sectors will benefit from that? That's number one. Number two, sectors that will benefit from the AI secular growth trend. Sorry, a bit of a typo here. Should be secular growth trend. And number three, I think sectors that underperformed last year because they went through an earnings recession and this year their earnings are beginning to recover, I think that these sectors could rebound and outperform this year. So what sectors am I talking about? Specifically, four sectors. Number one, the technology sector. Number two, the financial sector. Number three, healthcare. And number four, industrials. I think these are the four sectors that could outperform the market this year. In addition to these four sectors, I'm also bullish on the small caps, which are the small companies, which I don't usually buy individually, but I buy them through an ETF, like the IWM ETF. And for me personally, I bought the VBK ETF, which is the small cap growth ETF. Now, again, I shared this initially on the 20th of January during my Market Outlook event. The four sectors, technology, healthcare, industrials, and financials, they have performed okay. They have uh, perform positively so far this year. And yeah, technology is outperforming, healthcare is outperforming. Uh, industrials and financials, slightly outperforming, slightly. Okay, so, so far, so good. Let's see what happens throughout the rest of the year. Uh, now, specifically, let's take a look at why these sectors. So, number one, technology. I believe technology will not just outperform this year, it will outperform for uh, the near future. Because again, we are in this six wave innovation super cycle that is driven by AI and automation. So technology is definitely a sector that 
I want to be fully allocated in. I want to be overweight on this sector. At the same time, when interest rates fall, it will lead to further PE expansion of technology stocks. Specifically, which technology stocks uh, am I really, really focused on? Well, three areas. Of course, we want to be uh, focused on the ones that will benefit the most from the AI revolution. So first will be cloud computing. Almost every business on the planet will have to use cloud computing services because they want to be online. They need to get online. So Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, in my opinion, is a must-have in every portfolio. Combined, they make up 65% market share of the cloud computing market. And it's a recurring business. It's a business that is very, very sticky. Uh, the second would be companies that provide the semiconductors required for AI and automation. We call this AI accelerator semiconductor companies. And NVIDIA is the market leader with 90% market share. And AMD is the second in place with a 4% market share. Now, some people say, well, how about AMD? Because AMD looks like it could catch up to NVIDIA and grow its market share. Well, that's possible. But the funny thing is, if you look at both, um, AMD is not cheaper than NVIDIA. In fact, it could still be slightly more expensive than NVIDIA. And between the two, I'd rather uh, stay invested with the market leader. And AI semiconductor chips for the next 10 years will grow estimated with an annual return of about 24%. The third area would be in AI software. Two types of AI software. Number one would be cybersecurity, which is projected to 7x over the next 10 years. So to be invested in cybersecurity, you could look at the ETFs, like one of the top ETFs is the IHAK, or individual companies, of which my two favorites are Fortinet, FTNT, and Palo Alto, PANW. So currently, I am invested in Fortinet. I have been buying Fortinet for uh, quite a while right now, and it's run up quite a bit since it announced great earnings uh, last week. Uh, Palo Alto, I'm not yet invested in it because it's been too expensive. I've been waiting for it to drop, drop. It's not dropped yet, but who knows? Maybe in March and September, if it drops, I will add some Palo Alto. Next, we enterprise software using AI, of which there are two. One is Palantir and UiPath. Now, UiPath is a bit more speculative because it's not really profitable yet. Uh, and a bit expensive. So my preference would be Palantir, which you guys know I made a video on it last year. I'm very bullish on Palantir. I've been holding it for quite a number of months right now. And again, they just released blowout earnings and the stock you know, went up 40% uh, in four days. So yeah, some of you may say, is it too late to buy Palantir? Yes, I think so at this price, but you never know. Uh, in March, September, if it retraces back down again, there could be a chance to add more shares to Palantir. Now, I'm also looking at financial stocks as well as healthcare stocks to outperform this year. Now, so far, healthcare has been outperforming, which is great. Financials, slightly, okay? So again, why these two sectors? Because these two sectors were unloved last year. They were out of rotation. So again, we call it sector rotation. Money flows out of the sectors. They are unloved and everything falls. And usually after... Um, uh, sector goes out of rotation, eventually it will get back in rotation where money flows back into the sectors and they start to outperform. It's kind of like a musical chess. You know, every sector takes turn to outperform and underperform. So since they underperformed last year, I think they could uh, outperform this year if their earnings recover. So the reason why they underperformed last year was because these two sectors, financials and healthcare, in 2023, they had negative earnings growth. They went through an earnings recession where financials, uh, their earnings uh, dropped 2.6% year on year and healthcare might got 20% earnings contraction year on year. Now this year, 2024, financials are expected to grow at 6% year on year. Uh, not really, really exciting because financials, you have to understand, they don't really grow double digits. So if financials grow single digits, it's pretty good. Now this is talking about the entire financial sector, of which a lot of it is made of banks, which I avoid, because banks tend to be very cyclical with low growth. So I tend to go for specific financial companies that have very high growth, like uh, payment technology companies, like Visa, MasterCard, no, not, not PayPal, all right? Um, as well as ratings agencies, like S&P Global, Moody's. These are the ones 
uh, they have very high growth rates. Um, but the banks tend to pull down the growth rates, right? Um, next, healthcare. So healthcare is projected to grow at 17% this year. And that's why last year I bought a lot of healthcare stocks. And this year, a lot of them are now rebounding quite a bit. Like I bought MedPace, which I'll talk about more later on. I bought Thermo Fisher. I bought Viva Systems. And I bought a lot of United Health and Elevance Health. And so far, they have rebounded significantly already in the first uh, month of the year. But you know what? They could still go a lot higher and they could retrace for more shares to be added. Next, I think industrial stocks could also do well as PMIs rebound from their bottom. So what are PMIs? Purchasing Managers Index, which measures the health of the country's manufacturing or services sector. So over here on this chart, you can see this is a long-term chart that shows you the manufacturing uh, PMI index in red and the services index or non-manufacturing index in blue. And you can see it's pretty much in a long-term range where it expands, contracts, expands, contracts, expands, contracts. Now, uh, last year, you can see that it contracted all the way down to here. So these, this is the manufacturing PMI that went all the way down to here. And you can see historically, this is kind of like the bottom of the range. And so when it starts to, to bounce up from the bottom, you know that uh, manufacturing activity is beginning to rebound. And when that happens, industrial stocks will tend to uh, rebound as well. So, uh, so far, the latest reading for the manufacturing PMI came in at 53 and a half. Sorry, my bad. 49, 49, uh, which is somewhere around there. So, yep, it has been rebounding back. And for the services PMI, just came in uh, after it hit, again, this uh, kind of like bottom in the range. It's now bounced up to be about 50, 53 and a half. So, I think that with this happening, industrials could... Uh, outperform as well. Now, personally, I don't really buy industrial stocks because industrial stocks tend to be generally in the long run, low growth. They don't outperform the S&P 500 and they tend to be pretty cyclical. So there are only a few industrial stocks I, I would buy that have got good growth. One of them is Pool Corporation and another one is Lockheed Martin, which I've already sold. But generally, again, industrial companies like Caterpillar, uh, Honeywell, they tend to be low growth and cyclical. So if I think industrials are going to rebound this year and they're actually starting to rebound, I won't really invest in them, but I'll just buy the ETF for a short-term trade. And the ETF you could look at uh, to get exposure to industrials is basically the XLI ETF. So if you take a quick look at the uh, industrials ETF XLI, you can see that it already has broken out for the year. It was uh, making a high last year and then it pulled back and then it made uh, the same high, pulled back. And so this is kind of like what we call a base consolidation pattern and it broke out of that pattern and now it's beginning to run up. So again, it should run up for the rest of the year. And uh, if there's any pullback, pull back to this area of previous resistance and support, that could be a buyable area if it pulls back to the area for a continuation of that trend for the rest of the year. The next beneficiary of falling interest rates would be small caps, as well as REITs, by the way, but I'll leave that to a separate topic because I can talk about REITs in an entire video by itself. But small caps. So small caps are basically small companies. Now, historically, small caps used to outperform large caps because small caps are smaller, they've got more growth potential than large caps that are already very big. But in recent years, you see that small caps no longer outperform large caps. Large caps outperform small caps. But now they have outperformed to such a large extent that I think that small caps, there's a high chance it would rebound back to close the gap with large caps. Now, if you take a look at this chart, you'll notice something interesting. Pre-COVID, uh, large caps, which are represented by the S&P 500 ETF, the SPY, and the one in orange would be the IWM, which is the small cap ETF. You can see they pretty much are in sync, right? They're pretty much in sync, but most of the time, again, large caps would slightly outperform small caps. Now, COVID changed everything. You can see what happened during COVID. When COVID hit, they both went down, but small caps went down more 
than large caps. And during the rebound, large caps rebounded a lot faster than small caps. And this gap has gotten wider ever since then. Now, what's the reason? The reason is very simple. COVID really screwed up small companies. So for small companies, because they are small, they don't have as much cash, they've got more debt, they are not as resilient as big companies with lots of resources. So small caps really got uh, whacked during COVID. And then in 2022, when the Fed raised interest rates at the fastest rate in history, small caps suffered the most. Because again, small caps, they have a lot of debt. And when interest rates rise, they have to pay a lot more interest on the debt, their profits collapse. And many small caps, they don't have a lot of cash. So they have to keep raising cash through debt or by uh, issuing shares. And with high interest rates, it's hard to do that. And that's why they have been underperforming and very much going nowhere in the last year or so. Whereas big companies like, like Meta, Amazon, Nvidia, high interest rates are actually good for them. Because these big companies, they're immune to high interest rates. They earn more interest income because of the large cash on their balance sheet and they have got hardly any debt. So you see this big gap right here. But once interest rates fall, we should see this gap narrow. I don't expect large caps to come down as much as I ex expect small caps to at least rebound, to at least you know close the gap with large caps. Now, I don't buy specific small companies because I think they're too risky for me to buy. I'm a very, very conservative person, but I'll buy the ETF for more of a short to medium term trade while small caps catch up. Now, I've already bought it. I already bought the small cap ETF. There are a few of them. The one I bought is the VBK, which is the small cap growth ETF. So I started buying it, uh, I think about a month or two months ago. Yeah, about there, I think about a month ago. So, so far it has started uh, rebounding and I think that there's a lot more room for it to run. Let's take a look at the charts. So this is the VBK and I'm looking at the weekly candles and you can see it's pretty much been in this range over here uh, for the last uh, year or so, right? It you know, went up, went down, went up, went down, went up, went down, right? It's stuck in this range. And you can see that recently kind of like started to break out of this range. All right, it broke out of this range and then retraced and now it looks like it could be setting up to begin to move higher again. Uh, when rates start to fall, that's when you see this will really begin to run up. Again, there's no guarantee, but I think there's a high chance it will run up. Now, if you zoom down to the uh, daily candles, you can see a clearer view of the daily candles that it has started to run. Uh, but it's not that far yet from the moving average, right? So we've got that wave up, we've got a wave down, and now it's beginning to uh, wave up over here. So that's the VBK. Now, at the start of every year during my Market Outlook event, I will share what I think are the highest quality stocks with the most compelling value at the time. So this was presented again in, uh, on the 20th of January, which I thought they still had very good value. Some of them still have very good value, but some of them have run up quite a bit, so they may not they may no longer be that cheap. But again, you never know, we could get the correction in March or, or September to give them back that attractive value. But these were the stocks I presented and I'll run through them one by one to show you what I think is the latest intrinsic value and uh, the levels where I think I would want to add more shares myself. So these are the eight stocks that I think um, would do well this year and for years to come. Amazon, that's always my number one favorite, and it's currently the biggest position in my portfolio. Number two will be Google, Alphabet. Number three, Meta Platforms. Again, one of the biggest positions in my portfolio. Uh, Fortinet, which is a cybersecurity company. So all these are within the technology sector I talked about. Healthcare, Healthcare United Health, uh, Viva Systems, and MedPace, which I just bought recently, in fact. Bought MedPace about a couple of weeks ago. And for financials, basically it's just uh, S&P Global. So let's begin with Amazon. So ever since I presented it back on the 20th of January, which was uh, somewhere around here, you can see that it's run up quite a bit, especially this gap up after solid earnings, but it is still undervalued. So my intrinsic value for Amazon currently is $182. So 174, it's slightly below valuation. But like I said, I don't add shares just because it's undervalued. I add only when it retraces to a level of support. And on the daily candles, 
I would like to see it retrace to at least the 50 moving average minimum. So this is the 50 moving average over here. So right now you can see the wave up, the wave down, the wave up, wave down and wave up. So I never chase it once it runs, right? So I like to let it wave up and then eventually it's gonna wave back down to at least that 50 moving average before I would add it back again. Now currently the 50 moving average would be somewhere around 157. But bear in mind that as the price moves, the moving averages will move as well. And that's why I update my, my support levels every month for my subscribers of the Ultimate Investors Playbook. And at the same time, the intrinsic value also changes uh, every time the company begins to report uh, new results. So that's something that I update for my subscribers as well. Now, if you've taken my Whale Investor course, you've learned all these skills, you can uh, update your support levels every month and you can recalculate your intrinsic values as well. So that's Amazon. Next would be Alphabet, which is uh, also known as Google. So Alphabet actually, they announced pretty good results. Everything was great, except they missed on just one little item and the market freaked out and we had that drop over here, right? Boom, went down. By the way, what's the intrinsic value of Google? Intrinsic value is 172. Yep, so this is still very, very undervalued. But again, I like to buy after a wave down and this was a perfect buying opportunity right here. So again, I presented this stock on the 20th of January, which was somewhere, uh, somewhere over there, right? And then it went up after that and then earnings came and it kind of like gapped down to the support level, right? So that's the first support level. And then since it's, it's run up over there. So very undervalued, but again, uh, would I add at this point of time after it's waved up? No, I'll wait for it to again retrace back down nearer this 50 moving average at least uh, at about 140, yeah, for now. But again, it will change as, as time goes by. Support levels will go up over time. Next will be Meta Platforms, which is I think one of the best performing stocks in the last 12, 24 months. So Meta intrinsic value is $480. Right now it's at 468, so it is uh, pretty much at fair price. And again, I, I don't like to buy something at fair price. I like to buy something at a discount, so we've got a margin of safety. And you can see that it's run up uh, quite far above the moving averages, right? Very far above the 50 moving average. So yeah, I hold matter, and if you do, would I sell? No, I wouldn't sell because it is still fairly priced. I remember, I only sell something if it's grossly overpriced. Like if Meta went up to $1,000, I'll start selling, right? Because $1,000 would be like 100% above intrinsic value. That's when I'll start to think, okay, it's a bit crazy, I'll get out. But right now it's, it's, it's not overpriced, okay? So I, I wouldn't sell, okay? But neither would I buy because technically it is overextended, right? Wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down, wave up. <laughs> extended right i like it to kind of like retrace back again at least near to the 50 moving average at about three 390 then then i'll add more meta shares now some of you may be thinking are you sure can it drop all the way to 390 it's so far away you never know <laughs> okay those of you who have been in the markets for the last 10 20 30 years know that once the sentiment shifts oh the market can suddenly drop 5 10 15 percent and High beta stocks could drop 20%, 30% in a heartbeat, okay? So when that happens, you've got to be psychologically prepared. Don't freak out, oh my God, I'm going to die. That's an opportunity to add more shares, right? So one thing I learned in my career is, you know, never chase the girl. You know, once the girl runs, let her run. Wait there patiently, she'll run back to you eventually. Now, if she doesn't, there are many other girls out there who are just as attractive or beautiful, okay? Inside. Next, we have got cybersecurity company, Fortinet. So Fortinet just shared it in the market outlook on the 20th of January, which was somewhere there when it was just below the 200 day moving average. Uh, and it was at the support level. So that was the point where many of my students, yeah, the moment they heard it, uh, they did their research and they started adding at $62. And of course, students in my community, we bought you know, much lower around this area here last year. So for Fortinet, the intrinsic value is $73, and at $70, it is still undervalued. 
Uh, but right now you can see wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down, wave up after earnings. And it's kind of like consolidating right here. So again, on the daily candles, I would personally add more only if it retraces uh, to the closest level of support. And in this case, I would say the closest level would be about uh, $63. And again, it, it may not go there, it may run up again. So in that case, I'll then raise the support levels over time and the intrinsic value will go up as well over time. Uh, next, we have got S&P Global, SPGI, which is the only financial stock uh, in this particular uh, watch list. So I've been holding SPGI for quite a number of years. Uh, right now, this stock is overvalued. You can see the intrinsic value is $406. All right, currently it's about 437, so it is overvalued. And again, uh, I would say the level to add is only when it retraces down to at least uh, $403, which is where uh, was a previous uh, resistance. Uh, previous resistance becomes support, and that would be just below the 406 intrinsic value. Next, we go on to the healthcare stocks, the first of which is Viva Systems. I've also been holding this for quite a number of years and Viva's intrinsic value is $261. So this is still pretty undervalued. So, so like I said, in this market where there are many stocks that are overpriced, there are still some quality companies that are still reasonably priced. So this is still undervalued. Um, let me just go down to the daily candles over here. Yep. Uh, but you can see again, it's after wave up pattern, right? So wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down, wave up. Okay. So uh, again, my level to add would be about 196, even though it's undervalued, but we want to always add on a retracement to a level of support at this point of time. Next, United Health. The other healthcare company, intrinsic value 548. So this one is undervalued and well, close enough to the second level of support. So I would say for investors who are building a new position, right, this would be a level that would be attractive to add shares for United Health. And finally, another healthcare stock, MedPace. So this one, when I first introduced it to um, the community and on the outlook, it was right here. You can see wave up, wave down right at this 50 moving average support. That was on the 20th of January. Beautiful. And I said, I'm adding more there myself. So you can see the intrinsic value is 336. So at that point, very undervalued. Well, not very, quite undervalued and retraced with support level. That was a great place to add. Now, since then, of course, it has waved up. So right now it is still slightly below the intrinsic value, but I wouldn't add more there. So I want to add more myself because I've not bought enough yet. So I'm waiting for the next uh, wave down pattern, at least to the 50 moving average at about 300 to add more myself. So there we are. Those are the eight uh, high quality stocks that I think are still reasonably priced, but it doesn't mean that now is the level to add yet. The S&P 500 continues to be on this very strong wave up pattern, breaking the 5,000 mark yesterday. It's times like that that I wouldn't chase it. It could go higher, but I would wait patiently for that correction to appear in the later part of the year. Hope you enjoyed it and may the markets be with you. If you want to catch my latest videos, click on the subscribe button right now. Click on the bell so you get instant notifications once I upload my latest video. If you want to check out my online courses, go to piranaprofits.com. We're going to learn how to invest and how to trade the financial markets and create an income from all around the world. If you want to join my live Wealth Academy program, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com and find out more about how you can learn investing and trading live online. This is Adam Koo and may the markets be with you.